Our scripture today is from the book of James. If you would like to, to follow along, you're more than welcome to in your, uh, your uh, pew Bible there. Book of James, chapter 1, verse 17 to 27. Um, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the reading of this word, for the giving of this word. You who gave it to us that we might know what it is you desire of us. We ask you that your Holy Spirit reigns during this reading, that it encourages or challenges as you deem necessary for our lives. We also pray for the presence of your Holy Spirit in the expounding upon the word. That it too is used for your glory. And Lord, anything's not from you, we pray is forgotten. We thank you for your love, for your care, for your presence. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. James chapter 1, verse 17 to 27. Every generous act of giving with every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. In fulfillment of his own purpose, he gave us birth to the word of truth, so that we would become a kind of first fruits of his creatures. You must understand this, my beloved. Let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. For your anger does not produce God's righteousness. Therefore, rid yourselves of all sordidness and rank growth of wickedness, and welcome with meekness the implanted word that has the power to save your souls. But be doers of the word, and not merely hearers who deceive themselves. For if any are hearers of the word and not doers, they are like those who look at themselves in a mirror. For they look at themselves and on going away immediately forget what they look like. But those who look into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and persevere, being not hearers who forget, but doers who act, they will be blessed in their doing. If any think they are religious and do not bridle their tongues but deceive their hearts, the religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to care for orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. This is the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I confess I don't have a sermon title slide. It slipped my mind when I was making it. So, picture the Eiffel Tower and with the words saying spiritual versus religion. Sound good to you? Got that in your mind? That'll be the sermon title and sermon slide for, for today. Before we get to that point, though, uh, let's talk for a moment about the book of James. I love the book of James. I've always loved the book of James. It's been a very close, uh, close to my heart, this book. And uh, one of the reasons I love it, you will not be surprised, is that it's short. And it's easy to read within an hour. You sit down, it's five, six chapters, and there are five, six very challenging chapters. Uh, book of James, when it comes to the Bible, is more or less where the rubber meets the uh, road. Are you familiar with that? That metaphor, rubber meets the, the uh, road. Um, what it means basically is a car, for example, uh, that the car has an engine, it has a gas pedal, it has a brake pedal, and an exhaust, and you know, all of the components, everything that makes a car go. But the thing that really makes the car practical is where the rubber meets the road. You can put a car up on a, on a jack. Uh, eight feet in the air and turn the car on and press the gas and press the brake and it all works, but what good is it? It's up on a jack. It's good is where the rubber meets the road, where the tires do their work, where you actually turn the engine on, press the gas, and you go. And that's James, that's James. This, all this teaching that Paul has and in the Gospels about, um, uh, about the love of Christ, the obedience of Christ, what Jesus requires of us, why God made us, what we're for, what it is we're supposed to believe, all this stuff, James says you put it into action. You do it where the rubber meets the road. 
where the spirituality meets religion, and we'll get deeper in depth in that in a moment. James is an extremely challenging book because it's, it challenges those who know Jesus through and through, who know the Gospels, who know all the books of the Bible. My dad once knew a person in, um, in the mill where, where he, he worked in uh, <coughs> um, Clar- Clarton Mill when he, he worked there. Uh, a man who could quote you the Bible, scripture and, and verse, who could do chap, chapter and verse. Dad could say, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 7. The man would quote it for you. Uh, but the man believed nothing of it. Uh, it. It didn't register in his heart. It just stayed in his mind. And James challenged that. James was saying that the way one lives out the faith, the way one shows the faith is by doing the faith. Now, in fact, for James, it got so strong, his, his verbiage in his book was so strong that there were some theologians who fought back against James. Luther was among them. He hated, well, I don't know if hated is the right word, but he did not like at all the book of James. He saw it as the book of straw. Uh, Martin Luther was a man who believed in salvation through faith alone. And indeed, that's the truth. We have salvation through Jesus Christ by our faith, by our belief. What it is that we believe is that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, came down to die for our sins, and therefore we are saved. James was spouting that, okay, you have faith, show it. If you don't show it, your faith is worth nothing. Luther thought that this was getting too far into works righteousness. That working our way into heaven is something that's impossible. In the book of the Bible, it's Christ who gives us heaven through mere gifts. James wasn't saying that you work your way to heaven. James was just saying that true faith is shown through works. James, and I hesitate to say this because it might be in next week's Scripture, James was saying that the, even the, the demons believe, the demons believe that Jesus Christ is God's Son. The demons believe that Jesus Christ came for the, the sins of the world, but the demons don't use that as salvation. They believe it and they fear. They don't work it. They don't live it. They don't act like it. James is saying, if we have faith in Jesus Christ, we need to live that faith. Show where the robber meets the road. Now, we can be hearers of the the Word. One of my favorite examples of hearers of the Word was my time at, uh, uh, oh, what's that? Billy Graham. can't believe I couldn't remember his name for a second. Billy Graham Crusades. Um, Billy Graham Crusades came through Pittsburgh while I was a teenager, um, 14, 15, 16 years old, somewhere around there. Do you remember those when that came? Uh, They met at Three Rivers Stadium, I do believe, when it was still up. Um, And I was one of the young folks who got to go down onto the onto the, the floor of the stadium and pray with people who uh, gave a first-time com- commitment through Jesus Christ. There was adults who did this too. Um, it was quite a wonderful time. And, and people were on fire for Christ. And, and it was great. And, and Carmen concerts. Who remembers Carmen? Carmen the in- entertainer. He uh, was a Christian entertainer. And he did a lot of singing. And, and it was wonderful. He came to Pittsburgh a few times to Civic Arena uh, when I was there. So, again, when I was a teen, teen, teenager. And he was great. And people were raising their hands in the air and praising Jesus and lifting Jesus on high. And there was, was swaying back and forth. And when they did the altar call, everyone went down. And it was fantastic. You never heard a parking garage that sounded less like the concert or less like the Billy Graham crusade in your entire life. I can't believe he cut me off. 
and they would flip the bird and, and they would pound on, on the, the, the horn. We all heard the same thing. We all praised Jesus the same way, but and you never seen people so quick to cut in front of other people. They got to get home. They got to, I, I swear, every single one of them, their houses were on fire. They had to go home and put out the fire or save their pets. And this was my first impression of what it meant to be on fire for God. In word, but not in, in deed. Now, I overgeneralize. It wasn't everybody. But there was enough to make you wonder. It, I think it coined the phrase... Um, I am, have you ever heard this phrase, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious? You hear that phrase? I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. People might say it um, a lot when I say things like you should go to church. Well, you know, I'm, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. Here's what it means, at least from me, my definitions of it, that someone considers themselves spiritual when they believe that they themselves are part of something bigger. That there's something more to this world than we can see. That, that uh, it's those moments where you enter a house and you feel something more about the house. You can't put your finger on it, but it feels like a, a chill down your back, down your spine. Or it feels like a, um, a big hug, uh, a warmth and a joy that you can't explain. You don't know where it came from. Or a time when you're standing on the top of a mountain and you're looking at a, the most gorgeous view in, in the world and you finally think, there's an order to this. There's a reason, a purpose for this. I can't put my finger on it. I don't know what it is, but there's more here than what I see. You can, that's the spiritual sense of this world. That there's far more to this world than we actually see. There's a spirituality to it. Now, there are plenty of people in this world who are spiritual and not religious. And they say that they're spiritual and not religious because what religious means then is that you take that spirituality and you put it into action. You take your life and you, you order it based upon the spirituality that you feel. You live according to it. You, you surrender yourself to it. And, and the reason people say that they're spiritual and not religious is because people who call themselves religious don't always do a very good job at it. Now, if religion is a, a working spirituality, a surrendering to spirituality, can you be religious and not spiritual? The answer is yes. James says it. You've got to find out where James says it. If, you, if any think they are religious and do not bridle their tongues and deceive their hearts, a religion is worthless. There is a religion out there that's not spiritual. It's a form of spirituality, but not an actuality of it. It's a, it's a believing that if I do the right things and not necessarily believe what, I, what, what is behind them, then everything's okay. It's a, I've come to church on Sunday because that's what I've done for my entire life. I don't believe the things that are said. I, I challenge it all. It means nothing to me, but coming to church is what I've always done. It's a taking communion because everyone else is. And it's a great meal. I don't know why. A little piece of bread and a little juice tastes good. It's uh, saying that you're a Christian because it makes you popular with the people you want to be popular with. Religion without spirituality is dangerous. And it's what gets us in this trouble of people saying, I'm religious. But I'm not, or I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious because religion without spirituality is nothing more than, oh, and the word just left me, uh, institution. It is a, a protecting of the 
United Methodist denomination and holding up the United Methodist denomination higher than Christianity itself. It is taking more pride in the fact that I am United Methodist than it is in the fact that I I belong to Jesus Christ. It's saying that the United Methodist denomination is the only right way to believe in Jesus Christ and everyone else is wrong and lost. It is protecting a denomination at the loss of a belief in Christ. Protecting an institution and letting go of that which is behind it, the Spirit. It has hurt so many people when we are religious and not spiritual. I am a Christian. Get the heck out of my way. I believe in Jesus Christ. How dare you have 13 items in a 12-item aisle? Jesus died for my sins. And I can't believe you wore those shoes with that pants. James is saying very clearly that we cannot or should not have one without the other. Believing that we're part of something bigger is so important, but then living that out to the love of others is the rest of it, and as necessary as the the, uh, first. Um, C.S. Lewis had trouble believing in Jesus Christ because the institution was so big, I think. And, and for him, he believed in atheism um, until one day he finally looked and he saw the world had a, an order to it that he couldn't explain. It was um, that there were, across civilizations, all throughout history, um, a set of rules that were normalized, meaning the Ten Commandments, at least the last five of them. Uh, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not um, uh, envy, uh, covet a neighbor's wife for goods, you know, those ones. And he asked himself, why? Why are these considered moral truths? And even up there, in fact. And he started looking, and for him it led to Christ. It led to, to God. First it led to God, and then later to, to Christ. And then after that, he recognized that things needed to change. He had to then live that truth out. The church is at its best when it proclaims Jesus Christ, not only through the words, through the education, the things that we know, but also by loving those who are around us. I think Jesus had it right. I think Jesus always had it right. Um, but I think that what Jesus said, his summary of the law and the Gospels, is most beneficial when we're studying the book of James. And what that is, is that there are two greatest commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength. The belief. The knowing who God is. And then the second, which is the same as it, to love your neighbor as yourself. The living that out. The doing it. And the challenge of living those both, as we see in James, is difficult, but necessary. He ends this particular uh, teaching with 27. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this. Not to go to church on Sunday, not to study the Bible through Bible studies. These are important, but it's lived out in this. To care for orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. To do. To act. To not pass up opportunities, which we have all done. I have done. But to ask the Lord for another chance to love those who are around us, and to freely do that because of what Christ has done for us. I share with you now this final prayer. Thank you, Father, for having created us and giving us to each other in the human family. Thank you for being with us in all our joys and sorrows, for your comfort in our sadness, for your companionship in our loneliness. Thank you for yesterday, for today, and for tomorrow. 
and for the whole of our lives. Thank You for friends, for health, and for grace. May we live this and every day conscious of all that has been given to us. Amen and amen. Go in peace, knowing that the love of the Lord goes with you now and always.